Hey everyone, welcome everyone to another Stock Market Open Livestream. Today we are looking at retail sales, which come out in about 1 minute and 15 seconds. We'll be getting the Empire Manufacturing Report, looking for a negative 5.2. Retail sales looking for 0.4 on growth. Control Group also looking for 0.4. Business Inventory is looking for 0.4. So a whole lot of 0.4s across the board is what we're looking for. X Auto, we're looking for 0.5. So when you remove Auto, you're ex actually expecting it to be stronger, suggesting Auto is weaker and then when you remove auto and gas we should be at 0.3 suggesting gas is strong which oil prices have been going up so some of this makes sense uh, okay so we'll be seeing how this affects uh, are uh, open here. Right now, we're pretty dang green across the board. A lot of uh, uh, excitement and enthusiasm over uh, what could have been much more disastrous this weekend, ending up being a uh, relatively limited uh, foray by Iran. Uh, it, that was uh, almost like uh, throwing a, a little pebble at a giant Goliath. So that was, uh, that was quite quite a shocking and for a period of time a little scary. So let's watch what happens as retail sales numbers come in. They are expected now. Empire Manufacturing negative 14.3. Retail sales up way higher than expected. 0.7. X uh, Auto come month over month 1.1. That's twice as big as expected. Uh, retail sales X Auto Gas 1.0%. Uh, that's a little more than three times uh, at what was expected. And retail sales coming in at 1.1 versus the 0.4. This absolutely can Kills rate cuts uh, anytime soon here. This is a way of saying that now we've got inflation coming in stronger than expected for three months in a row. We've got jobs coming in stronger than expected, which remember real wage growth, that is uh, wage growth above the rate of inflation, uh, promotes uh, oh, wow. Okay. Uh, pr promote spending. Uh, so we just got revisions. All of the revisions are up. Oh my gosh. Retail sales advance month over month. They were expected to be 0. 0.6 for February. Got revised to 0. 0.9. X auto. We thought we had 0. 0.3 in February. That got revised to double to 0. 0.6. X auto and gas. We thought 0. 0.3. We got 0. 0.5. And control group. We thought we were flat at zero. We actually got 0. 0.3. So both the uh, both the current and prior retail sales figures substantial uh, su substantially higher than expected and uh, substantially revised. These are these are some pretty hot numbers here. Uh, again, this this should be sending our uh, bond market up. Uh, this should be sending, uh, well, as we can see here, the queues are starting to react to this, uh, coming down a little bit here. Uh, right now, it looks like we've got uh, bonds up 12.3 basis points uh, at the uh, time of this report. Uh, that puts us at 4.62 on the 10-year treasury. Uh, that clearly indicates very little fear pricing going in from a war point of view. Uh, that makes sense. Otherwise, we'd be seeing yields come down. Uh, much more, in fact, hey, this is a pretty strong economy, and here are uh, the facts of it. And we keep coming in stronger and stronger. So uh, let me take a look here. We've got, so I read through the numbers. I'm just looking at the retail sales report now. Let me see if I can download the whole thing. Uh, it's about a seven-page report, so we're going to download that see what kind of details we get uh, in the report but um, it's juicy that's for sure well, it's positive uh, it does indicate we've got a little bit of uh, of strength left in this economy and by a little bit of strength left <clears throat> apparently a lot all right let's take a peek here <coughs> excuse me okay uh here we go advanced monthly sales for retail and food services we've already gone through the headline but what you can see here is uh, this is where you can see the revised and uh, March figures for advanced monthly uh, movement here. Advanced estimates of retail food sales for March of 2024 adjusted for seasonal variation uh, were 709.6, up 0.7 from the previous month and 4% above March 2023. So definitely a solid set of growth here. 4% uh, is the year-over-year -year number right here. There we go. From March of 2023. Total sales from January 2024 through March were up 2.1%. Uh, and see, this is where you can actually see an acceleration. This, I think, is interesting. Uh, you are getting the cues actually recovering a bit right now. But you're seeing this acceleration 
in uh, some of the information here. So uh, it, we, we see that we moved a full 4% in basically a year, but we did that same, uh, or rather we did half of that movement in about three months. Uh, so that puts us on a faster rate. U.S. yields across the curve a jump after retail sales beat across the board. Blah, blah, blah. Yeah, okay. And uh, again, interesting here, you're getting uh, you're getting the cues that, that sort of immediately shot right back. Look at that, you got a pain hit, uh, and then you came right back. Let's see if that's sort of spreading and see how the market's reacting to prepare for trades. So you've got Trump, uh, his trial begins today, but surprising to see the stock down 18% in the AM here. You've got Tesla down about 1%, which is actually pretty nominal given uh, the 10% uh, layoffs, which were probably supposed to be as high as 20%, but I think sometimes the uh, actual decisions get catered a little bit based on market reactions. So 10% layoffs announced over at uh, Tesla. One of the things to remember, and then we'll keep going with this retail sales report, is that a lot of people will say, uh, oh, well, you know, Facebook and Amazon, they cut jobs and then they started, you know, their stocks started running. Well, a problem with that is Facebook and Amazon can actually expand uh, with engineering talent, uh, their services, w without as many employees. The same thing that happened at Twitter, and now known as X. You know, Elon went in and fired, what, 70, 80% of the staff, and, and the site was still able to operate. That's not necessarily true when you're firing people on manufacturing lines. Now, they're still waiting for exact details of who's affected by this, but that is something to pay attention to, because if you are getting... Uh, you know, manufacturing employees removed, then you are expecting to sort of quell production a little bit uh, in the face of lower demand. However, that could come with the opportunity to raise prices on some existing inventory, which you are seeing happen with uh, some of the Model Y units. So I don't know if that's signaling or if it's uh, just that's how they want to play the game now, which is a little bit more of an end phase strategy. Hey, we'll we'll uh, cut prices less, but we'll just we'll just produce more and then we'll just fire people instead. Yeah, who knows? But uh, again, you know, the stock being down 1% is actually pretty nominal, uh, really showing that Tesla has this real stickiness right around 170. And I don't think this retail sales report, well, ordinarily this retail sales report should indicate that yields are going to be higher for longer. And uh, this retail sales report is, um, is actually being cheered right now. I mean, Enphase is actually up about a third of a percent right here. And the queues are actually now rising. Uh, that's likely then as, uh, well, in part because markets may somehow be thinking, oh, is, is a recession getting closer? Is this retail sales report undoing the fears of a recession that we have? That's usually what you would see with a hot retail sales report. And what it does is it somewhat suggests are rates just less important for the stock market right now? That's entirely possible. Uh, that's something I've been thinking about for uh, about the last week or so now. This idea that, hey, what if it's not interest rates that drive the markets anymore? So let's think through that for a moment. So interest rates, obviously, as as they rose between, uh, uh, you know, so let's write this down. As uh, rates rose 550 basis points, the stock market fell substantially. We went from, let's see here, we went from uh, March, what is this, about 407 as a peak, 401 as a peak, all the way down here to 251, right? So as that path became clear, we went 251 divided by 401, the uh, NASDAQ fell about 37.5%. Uh, QQQ priced in 37.5% uh, of losses. All right, so that would be 401 to, what did we say it was over here? That was uh, 251. Okay, 251. Now, uh, what you're finding is, uh, as we're pricing in sort of this higher for longer, which higher for longer really started, I mean, we got the Fed pivot in December, this idea that we were gonna get cuts. But what's remarkable is from January, uh, we had, very clearly hot data, uh, certainly from February on, right? So we start getting our hot data mid-February. And it looks like mid-February, what we've done is we've really stabilized in pricing. So consider that for a moment. 
Let's go February CPI. So CPI schedule of releases. Uh, let's see here. February 13th is when we started getting hotter reads. So let's go to the day chart. Let's go straight to Feb 13th. Ah, how interesting. The data came out and we were down 1.93% on the following day. So look at 12.12, which was the day before the hot CPI report. That was our, our high, basically. So, uh, I mean, it wasn't. We, we've gone a little bit higher since then, but your intraday was 435. So let's write that down. Uh, intraday high prior to hot CPI report uh, was 438.56. February 12, 2024. And then look at where we sit now. We're at about 441 in pre-market. So we've been roughly flat since then. We've moved less than a percent since then. Uh, the QQQ index has moved less than 1% since then as we've started uh, uncutting or, or sort of unpricing cuts. We started uh, unpricing cuts. However, the market hasn't gone down but the market hasn't fallen. Some believe this is because of earnings and multiple expansion. So let's write that down. Some believe uh, that's uh, due to multiple expansion and earnings. Uh, it, so it, it shows that really, well, we've gotten uh, this, this data that's suggesting, hey, yeah, okay, we gotta unprice more cuts. What you're actually finding is the market's kind of chill with that. The market's pretty stable about that. Uh, and so the queues being up, you know, 85 bips on, on a hot retail sales report, pretty, pretty incredible. Now, you are also getting uh, stocks like Amazon, which are up 90 basis points right now. That's not a surprise on a hotter C, uh, retail sales report because, again, uh, we, we don't want to, any, any, any indication, frankly, that we're going into a recession. Going into a recession would indicate that we are going straight uh, to zero interest rates again, right? Zero ZERP policy, zero uh, effective lower bound. So let's see here. It does look like yeah, I see Fed Williams yapping this morning as well. So let me see what he's saying. Uh, Williams. Okay, so Williams says Fed policy is an important driver of rebalancing. Uh, I do think we have restrictive monetary policy, uh, likely start rate cuts this year. Uh, latest CPI is important info affecting the forecast. Market taking slower inflation progress into account. Don't see recent inflation data as a turning point. Oh, that's good. Uh, don't see recent inflation data as a turning point. Still see rate cuts this year. Okay. And uh, getting stronger tailwind from the supply side and getting more optimistic about the potential future growth. Well, that's good. Uh, I think he's right to be positioned about this potential for more future growth, since that seems to be exactly what we're getting out of a lot of these reports. Let me see if he's still alive. And members, according to the minutes, generally agreed that it should start soon. Does that mean May or... Does oh, yeah, here he is. Well, I think we said fairly soon, and, and uh, the uh, you know I think that the reasoning for uh, slowing the the pace of reduction of our balance sheet uh, makes a lot of sense. It's a prudent uh, course of action. Uh, we are decreasing the balance sheet quite rapidly, and and by slowing that, we'll have more ability to monitor, assess, and analyze as we get eventually to an ample reserves uh, kind of world that we're aiming for. Everything is going with the balance sheet. Uh, everything is going exactly as planned. Things are going well. When we decide to, uh, you know, slow the pace of the balance sheet, that's a decision for the committee. No decision was made at the last meeting, but obviously we'll get together relatively soon and, and discuss this further. But to me, this is a sign of success of the plans we laid out almost two years ago to reduce the balance sheet. We've had very little disruption it, in markets. It's, it's worked uh, exactly as planned, and we're just executing on that plan, and that's going very smoothly. So QT could come before rate 
votes. Yeah, these are really separate issues. I mean, on our, our shrinking the balance sheet, we're focused on getting to ample reserves. On monetary policy, we're very focused on achieving our maximum employment and price stability goals. Those are different objectives. Those instruments uh, can obviously move at different times and different ways. John Williams, thank you very much. President of the New York Federal Reserve, we'll send it back up to you. Yep, there it is. So uh, QT can begin before rate cuts. That's not a surprise. QT is potentially expected to begin as soon as June. Uh, sorry, as soon as May or June. QT uh, can begin before uh, rate cuts. Uh, again, expected uh, in May or June with about 50% uh, fewer treasury uh, sales, basically. That would probably bring you, uh, potentially, uh, bring you from 70 billion of treasury runoff monthly to 35 billion. Uh, of course, we're not sure over what time frame. Unclear over what time frame. Because again, they could go, you know, five bill per month uh, and, and eventually get to this sort of target. Okay, cool. So uh, let's see. Yeah, less tightening, you could argue, is a form of easing, but it is still tightening. So, uh, but anyway, here are the cues up 79 basis points on. These uh, these pretty hot retail sales numbers. I mean, real. I, I really, I would call this just a blowout. And it really, again, it suggests that the higher pricing could sustain. It, it suggests that uh, you're not getting any kind of recessionary reset anytime soon. Really, what you're doing is you're suggesting, hey, uh, we can uh, we we can kind of keep this party going for a while. You're telling the Fed that uh, not only can we keep this party going for a while, but you're telling the stock market, maybe interest rates don't matter. Maybe we should just care about earnings. Uh, and uh, quite frankly, a beat like this is really good. Uh, so uh, again, every level beating, I mean, I'm, I'm just looking at the numbers again here. It's, uh, it's really impressive how much of a beat this is with a prior revision so hot. So uh, across the board here, big, big changes uh, for retail sales. And it's frankly just great for stocks. And stocks just don't seem to care as much about interest rates right now, which gives you a bit of uh, enthusiasm or a bit more enthusiasm about potentially your, your AI plays. I mean, look at, uh, let's go into, uh, let's go ARM, for example. Okay, so where's ARM? ARM's up a percent today. Let's look at the day chart for ARM. You can see ARM's been in a, a consolidation pattern. A lot of AI has been. And so you, you get a down day, you get an up day, but you're consolidating. You've been consolidating on NVIDIA, you've been consolidating on ARM, you've been honestly just falling on AMD. And a lot of po folks are starting to say, you know what, maybe these are just the buy the dip opportunities we've been waiting for. If you think about AMD, for example, you're down at this point from, uh, what were we, $227 uh, dollars per share. You're down to 162.9. So 162.9 divided by 227. You're down almost 29% on, uh, on ARM right now, which is, uh, or sorry, on, uh, on AMD, which is pretty remarkable. Uh, Adobe full range of features available through an add-on subscription at $4.99 a month. What is that for AI stuff? It doesn't show the details yet. Let's see if I can get some details on what Adobe's doing. But yeah, obviously, I'm monetizing all of the AI chip spending is going to be the next big question. That's obviously the big question for Tesla as well, is uh, are we actually going to see some really big monetization out of those FSD prices? Uh, it's, it's probably a great catalyst, honestly, that uh, you moved move them down to uh, 99 bucks a month. But you're not going to see that for a while because they're doing free trials for a while now. So, you know, during free trials, you're not going to see any of this uh, uh, this sort of information. It does look like uh, Donald Trump's motorcade is heading to criminal court. All right, uh, let's see. Israeli war cabinet meeting today. Yeah, boy, what a... Uh, is a response is being heavily debated, but what a what a weekend! I mean, it, that could have gone really bad, really fast, and it was it came across pretty intense. But uh, boy, it was uh, fortunately a sort of a sweat wiper from the forehead. 
Okie dokie. Next up, we have... Let's see. A lot of things I wrote down. Let me pull these things up. So, uh, again, those uh, Tesla job cuts. Uh, I want to see... I'm still trying to see if I can get information on how many of these are going to be in the manufacturing side versus anything else. You really don't want more manufacturing. Uh, let's see. Tesla may cut prices to lift capacity after staff call. Uh, I'm not sure what that means. May cut prices to lift capacity after staff call. Tesla to cut over 10% of its workforce in global retrenchment. What does this mean? Let me click on this and find out what this means. All right. Okay. Tesla's step back, a prelude to two steps forward. Okay, I understand. Oh, wait, no, that's from January. That's old news. Tesla's profit margins may need time to navigate this rough patch. That was from January. Okay, today, Tesla's announcement to cut its workforce by 10% could cut 35 to 45 cents a share in costs. Uh, yet it's telegraphing that production capacity is above demand. Right, okay, that's cutting from your manufacturing side. Likely through year-end. It calls into question recent price hikes, which could dent sales, as current demand for battery electric vehicles wanes. Right, 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 right. So they're basically making this argument that how, how could you possibly raise vehicle prices while cutting jobs you know, it seems like it's what you're trying to do is send a short-term price signal, price action signal to the stock. Like, you know, what can we do to pump the stock right now? And it's like, yeah, robo-taxi events coming out. Yeah, cutting jobs, that's going to save money. Yeah, raising prices, we didn't need those jobs. That's, uh, that's sort of the messaging. But the question is, what's that going to do longer term? Remember, we raised the Model Y about a thousand bucks after April 1st to try to pull forward demand to March, and it's unclear that really did anything, uh, given that those March numbers were still disastrous. And so then the question is, okay, are people still in at higher prices, or do they have more earnings now from their job, or are they feeling more spendy or whatever? Who knows? Those are all the things we'll want to pay attention to. Let's uh, listen into. Uh, oh, this uh, that must be a commercial. I was gonna say. Let's pop it over here. I thought I saw something interesting. I didn't. So uh, okay, let's uh, let's see here. Uh, they raised the price of Model Y, then discounted inventory much more. Uh, some of that's come back. You know, you've got to look. Uh, if you look at the discounted inventory right now, some of the discounted inventory looks like it got a price increase. There were quite a few people posting over the night that they were looking at buying a Model Y, and they were looking to buy from the uh, vehicle inventory, uh, and then all of a sudden prices just moved up uh, in an unannounced move. And so uh, you're, still, you're, you're not really seeing uh, that, that major discounting right now in price, which on one hand is good because it's like, okay, cool, have we sort of bottomed out on the price, uh, which is what people are hoping for. But then the other concern is, or is this just signaling to stock investors, and is it misleading them? I I, I don't know. Uh, that's uh, that's the tough thing to evaluate right now. Let's listen in here. That's what what I what it's trying to say here. You want to have the filing in place. Oh, they're issuing new shares. Buyers, you get clearance, and yeah. I mean, I don't think it's too unusual to actually have that set up before you actually are going to execute the sales. And we're fortunate to have our next guest on set with us. He's actually looked at a lot of SEC filings over the years. Maybe he has a take on this. Uh, I want to welcome former SEC chairman and CBC contributor Jay Clayton. Good morning to you. Morning. morning. You, you, you understand this filing at all, by the way? I think, I think Mike has it exactly right. Um, to the extent you're going to raise primary capital or to the extent that people are going to be, people or security holders are going to be selling shares in the future, right. you want to get your ducks in a row. Um, I have about a million questions uh, about what's taking place over the weekend and how the markets have reacted. But I actually just want to start with the very basic idea that we're watching the markets this morning obviously rebound quite remarkably, given uh, the fact that we just had Dan Sr. on, uh, effectively quite worried about this escalating. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious, as somebody who's just watched markets over the years and seen what happened last week, and then we were watching Bitcoin over the weekend as sort of a risk on, risk off kind of thing, how you think about it? Wow. Well, that's kind of a off the top of my, my head um, question. Yeah. But uh, what have we seen over the last two years about markets? 
uh, and mar what have markets seen? Markets have seen that we really don't want a sharp dislocation with China. Right. We actually are continuing to allow oil to flow out of Russia um, for stabilizing purposes. We don't, we don't like $5 gas. We don't want $120 oil. I think markets um, are seeing the reaction um, around the world to this of, look, things are, things are right. okay as they are. China has no interest in their economy going down. Russia has no interest in their economy going down. We, you know, right. we are ha continue to have many bilateral discussions with China. So what kind of, we were talking about China earlier with, with David Sanger, uh, with Admiral Kirby. What is your sense of where we have leverage or don't with China as it relates to what's happening in, in Iran and, 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 and Israel? Meaning, as, as, what kind of pressure points do you think that China can put on Iran or do you think that they won't? I, I, th I think we had a really good discussion last week about this when Rahm Emanuel was on, right. that China uses economic coercion to get its way around the globe and that we have to recognize that. We also have economic coercion with China that a sharp decoupling from the right. U.S. would definitely cause a deterior continued deterioration in their economy. Uh, I think everybody, why, why did Janet Yellen go? Like Everybody likes the status quo now compared right. to, to a decoupling. Do we have to get somewhere in the future where we're not as susceptible but to coercion? doesn't it appear that we are moving... That's, that's, why we're, that's why we're building the plant in Texas. Well, I was going to say, we're building the plant in Texas. Meanwhile, the Chinese are saying we're not going to be using Intel chips, for example, in our networks in the future. Mm -hmm. So what does that say about where this all heads? Well, I think, I think you know, we always look at it from our side. Right. If, if we're going to decouple from them, you know, they're going to decouple from us over time. They don't, they don't want us to have the same well, but level that leave, of coercion. That'll leave us ultimately with less leverage, not more. No. Well, but with, well, we may have less leverage, but they'll have less leverage over us. Which is, if you ask, if you ask people, you know, what did we learn from the pandemic? There was a tremendous amount of economic leverage going both ways. We definitely learned that. Companies, you know, right. I've, I have called for large multinational companies, not, not in some kind of mandatory, you know, check the box way, but to discuss with their investors just how, how dependent on China they are so that we have an understanding of that. It, it goes both ways. I think leaders at each country, you can right. tell, are nervous about that, but that level of interdependence. I mean, it's a very interesting question about dependence because dependence creates a relationship. We have no dependence right now on Russia, right? Happily. But, but we also have no relationship with Russia it, at but, all. But, but relationships can be, <laughs> all, all relationships, all human relationships, they can be mutually beneficial or corrosive, right? People can use relationships mm. to their advantage in a very corrosive way. Just, and, and, and so right now, you, you, but your view is you would just get out of Dodge, if, if you will. No, I think, but I think showing that, you, let's put it this way, showing that you can leads to a more healthy dependence, right? When you're dependent and have no options, you're, you're, at, you're at somebody's beck and call. When you're dependent and have options, you know, you have a much more cooperative relationship. It's that way, any right. business, you don't want to have a single supplier, right? That supplier then has a great deal of control over your business. You can have an incredible relationship with a single supplier if you have alternatives. Do you, do you have a sense that multinational companies have adjusted to a degree because for so many, for a couple of decades, you know, I think it's so interesting the supply chain debate with with China. You know, one of the big concerns that you have is the more you uh, uh, you know suggest that uh, China essentially you know doesn't deserve to be part of our supply chain and and we can find alternatives, the more first of all you create less choice and potentially higher prices for the global economy, but eventually. Government intervention creates some form of problem, whether that's shortages or uh, some other weakness, like something to consider as trading nations are less likely to go to war together. And so by cutting China out of the supply chains, especially you know chip supply chains, you're potentially increasing the likelihood of uh, military tensions between the two. I'm not a calling for any kind of like Taiwan invasion. I've always been sort of anti that, but uh, that is something you've seen uh, in sort of mainstream economic thought. Uh, as far as uh, DJT, so oh, let's write this down quickly. DJT, Trump Media Group, uh, just got a little bit of a summary on what's going on here because 
We saw that on the charts. We're like, why is that thing down 17, 18%? Uh, that's very abnormal for the stock in the morning. So we go to DJT, down 15% right now. You can see it here. And uh, what we have is they filed an S1, allowing it to sell some stock. S1 filed, allowing the company to sell shares. Looks like they might be able to sell 21.49 million shares. Uh, issuable upon the exercise of some warrants and can sold, be, be sold by the company from time to time. Interesting. So it's it's really like a shelf offering. Uh, shelf offering. Uh, this allows them to just sort of, as the stock maybe has a meme full day and runs, they can dump. So we're unclear if that's... I mean, 60-something percent of the company is owned by Donald Trump. So it's probable that a good chunk of this money will be able to uh, just go to Trump, you know, whether that's in the form of a salary of millions of dollars or, or whatever. Uh, there's some really big opportunities there for uh, Trump to finally get some, some money out of DJT with this sort of shelf offering. So uh, we'll watch that and uh, we'll see the price action on the stock. Okay. Let's listen a little bit more here. To the extent we've held Bitcoin and right. stablecoin outside of it makes it more difficult. Uh, Jay Clayton, want to thank you. Mike Santoli, Leslie, thank you for hanging out. Yeah. All right. Well, they're going to transition to their six o'clock show. So uh, let's see. The world was too dependent on China for manufacturing. We need some pullback. It would also be helpful if China stopped stealing IP. Well, I totally agree. It'd be helpful if China stopped stealing IP. I just, just not the biggest fan of too much. Uh, screwing around with uh, the way the market's supposed to work. Solid as global markets look for some de-escalation in the Middle East, but we're yep. um, close to session highs of the morning as March retail sales crush estimates, strongest control group in over a year, 10 year for six. Our roadmap begins with these geopolitical risks for stocks, futures rallying on hopes that the conflict will not escalate further. Plus, Tesla cuts reportedly set to lay off more than 10% of its staff globally. CEO Elon Musk saying the company is looking for cost reductions and increased productivity. And yeah. financials in focus again. Goldman Sachs topping first quarter estimates fueled by trading and investment banking. Begin by kicking off a new week for the markets. Geopolitics obviously on the front burner, guys. We're watching some of the risk premium in oil uh, back below 85. Uh, Brent, I think, off of 90 once again. But what an eventful weekend. I think some people might be surprised. Yeah, I think regarding Tesla, by the way, I think this is the largest pruning that we've seen uh, in, on the manufacturing side, frankly, ever. Uh, now, the the size of the company's uh, employee base has obviously grown substantially to about 140,000. But, uh, you know, in 2017, you pruned about 2%. Uh, 2018, 9%. Laid off is probably a better way to phrase that rather than pruned. It sounds too insensitive otherwise. But um, you had uh, 7% in 2019. Uh, and I believe in 2022, the only layoffs we had were 10% of the white collar staff, not manufacturing. Uh, but I want to verify that. So let's see here, Tesla 2022 layoffs. The uh, because there was a point where they lay. Yeah, it was 10% of the salaried workforce, which was the manufacturing side. Uh, sorry, uh, was the non-manufacturing side. So, and that worked out to about 3% of total. So 3% of total. So the white collar layoffs sort of after COVID made sense. Well, we really haven't had manufacturing cuts since 2019. So this means uh, today's, let's write that down. Today's 10%, uh, uh, today's 10% uh, layoff is the first in five years uh, in manufacturing. So, Yes, it's happened before, but it's also it's quite a big chunk. And it makes sense. You know, interest rates have been pretty aggressive for a while. Let's keep listening in. Say Ukraine on the onset of that. First of all, it's completely different conflict and war. But the backdrop is different because that was right as the Fed was 
raising rates, on the precipice of raising rates in one of the fastest hiking cycles in history. And as Tom Lee, who we're going to talk about later, a fund strap points out, and he's in the buy the dip camp, that things like you know, the deleveraging, it was in a very different position in terms of margin debt with much higher levels then than we are now. And then you look, get into questions, Carl, about even if oil prices do go higher, if this gets worse, what's that going to mean for inflation? What's that going to mean for a Fed that we assume the next move is going to be a cut? Maybe that get cut gets pushed further out. That was what last week's sell off in the market was all about. And the view is, I mean, high frequency economics published on this over the weekend, it'll affect headline inflation, but not core inflation, which is what the Fed is really looking at. And the Fed doesn't have control over oil prices. Now you could argue it doesn't have control over insurance, right? Car insurance <laughs> right. either, which yep. is one of the culprits of these higher inflation readings. But that's one view as well. Yeah. Meantime, the, the discussion continues about how less intensive, oil intensive, energy intensive uh, the U.S. economy is. Apollo with a nice chart today from Torsten Slock, once again reiterating U.S. is the biggest oil supplier in the world. And in fact, this Wall Street Journal poll calling the U.S. economy the envy of the world as a lot of uh, forecasts get lifted. Retail sales, of course, we mentioned a moment ago, uh, seven tenths, core one one. We were looking for 0 0.5. February revised higher. February revised higher is key because remember when we got the February number, we were yep. all wondering, why isn't this stronger? January was weak. This was supposed to be a bigger give back. So the higher February bodes well. I, I would the one caveat with these numbers is they're not inflation adjusted. So they do incorporate higher prices that people are paying for things. But what was the CPI rate in March? 0.4%. And so what was... Yeah, they call these nominal retail sales for a reason. Of spending, where Americans are, are taking the price increases and they continue to spend. Online sales were particularly strong in this report. There's still lots of weak spots like furnishing um, and, and others, but between... Oh, yeah, that reminds me. Let's actually look at the actual chart. So I have that chart here. Uh, we were supposed to go back to it. So here you can see the... Uh, change let's see here let's see here revision median standard of error this would be the previous to current month chart right here so previous to current month that would be food and drinking places up 0.9 non-store retailers up 0.6 miscellaneous store retailers up 2.3 gasoline stations up 0.4 clothing and clothing accessories accessories up 1.0 sporting goods 1.2 General merchandise and department stores, basically flat to 0.1%, very low. Grocery stores, only 0.2%. Furniture did move up here, 1.8%. It's pretty good. Uh, motor vehicle, parts and dealers, a 0.8%. So that's to the previous month. And then if you look to the previous year, the big moves here are online's up maybe 0.9%. Food and drinking, 1.2. Uh, miscellaneous store, 2.6. See here, current month to, oh, to same month last year. Yeah, that would give you a year-over-year year number. The numbers actually aren't even that huge year-over-year. Year. They're just a 1% growth year-over-year year kind of just shows you stability compared to last year. Uh, feels stable compared to last year. I'm going to write that down because, well, that's what it seems like. <laughs> so, okay, good. So, um... But yeah, obviously a lot of debate will go into uh, Tesla today. I think there, there are really two aisles that you could go down. You can make the argument that, hey, RoboTaxi is so close, FSD is so good, prices have bottomed, this is normal, they're pruning the worst employees. You can make that argument. And uh, you could argue this is, this is fantastic, this is going to save, uh, you know, as we talked about, this is gonna save 35 to 45 cents a share in expenses. Uh, but that's going to be more towards the end of the year and for the full year. So uh, great, right? Those are strong things. We're going to make the company more efficient, right? Uh, this is normal. This is for efficiency, we could say. Uh, make the company more productive with who's left. Fine. And uh, the the other side of the coin, uh, people say it could be, hey, is this is this just Elon trying to signal that the stock should be going up? So. RoboTaxi event announced after that Reuters piece, FSD 12, which is a big leap forward, but the aggressiveness on marketing that 12, is that because it's truly great or is it because, uh, you know, now, now 
there's a desire to sort of realign the company's uh, earnings growth expectations with artificial intelligence via FSD, hence the free trial and the price cut uh, on FSD, rather than on vehicle production, right? Uh, so uh, focus is now AI versus vehicle production. That could be the uh, the idea, like, please pump the stock is, is the idea about uh, how some folks see it. So others see, no, like, AI is the future. So of course, that's the direction we're going to go. Uh, and I agree, a AI is the future, that's for sure. But where this shows up in earnings, that, that I think is going to be what markets pay close attention to. Okay, so let's see what else. Okay, four Israeli soldiers wounded in an explosion hundreds of meters inside of Lebanon. Yeah, they keep, Lebanon keeps getting pummeled by Israel. Hopefully that's not any kind of friendly fire. Let's listen in here. Looks like a very... Oh, yeah, Goldman earnings came out. I'm going to pull those up. Responding, at least as of now, positively. That was the best ROE since first quarter of 2022. Yeah. So a, a pretty good measure there. And I think the relative to performance and things like M&A and in trading compared to J.P. Morgan, we don't have Morgan Stanley yet. That would be a more direct comp, but looked better for Goldman Sachs. This is, their, this, this is where they shine, right, in this environment. They're not a net interest margin bank. They're not a NIM bank like a J.P. Morgan is, which is why people were excited about J.P. Morgan on a more hawkish Fed. This is a bank that does better when the capital markets wakes up. Absolutely, and there's, uh, there's some of the, uh, the commentary that uh, came along with the release in terms of strength of the, what they say is their world-class and interconnected franchises, the earnings power, executing on strategy, core strengths, the usual uh, Propaganda. No, I'm kidding. Um, no, I mean, on both sides, a lot of success here. Efficiency ratio near 61. Uh, OPEX, what, down three and revenue up 16? And in fact, lower than expected equity and debt as well in terms of at least the performance in the IB. And so, for example, Mike Mayo uh, at Well saying that even adds to the quality of the beat. Again. Yeah, let's take a look at that. So net interest income did beat at Goldman as well, 1.61 billion versus 147. I know they were just saying that's not as big of a deal for Goldman, but that's still a lot of income. You know, billion bucks and a quarter, I'll take it. Uh, Goldman Sachs and net revenue was 14.21 billion versus the 12.98. You've got EPS coming in at 11.58 versus 8.79 a year ago. Uh, loans coming in a little softer at 184 billion versus 185.3. Uh, equities and trading came in at 3.31 versus the 27, sorry, 296 expected, 2.96 expected. AUM comes in a little softer than expected at uh, 285 trillion, 2.85 trillion versus 2.92. Boy, that's just that's a lot of money. So uh, Goldman Sachs clearly beating some expectations here creating some excitement and a lot of that on uh, the trading side. Uh, and their stock is up about 4% in pre-market here. We're about 19 minutes away from uh, the opening. We have DJT is down about 14% in pre-market. Tesla's only down half percent in pre-market, uh, although there's very, very little red today. Uh, you've got Apple and Tesla both down about half percent. And so less than a page of red, we go down to what do we have here. This is the upside. You've got Astero Labs IPO. It's a pretty volatile AI play along with QuantumScape. These, these folks can move on euphoric days and move a lot on depressed days. Reddit's up 1%. Google's up 1%. Google just released AI for photos, which was interesting. Uh, I mean, this is the sort of AI technology that we've, we've seen talked about for really over the last year or so. And it's sort of like remove objects, remove blur, uh, you know, enhance photos with AI, whatever, whatever, whatever. Uh, these are the sort of things that uh, Google is now building in and uh, providing some uh, features on for their users into Google Photos. So, all right, let's see here. Then uh, let's go take a jump over to Doomberg. And we do have... Oh, let's see here. We've got about 17 minutes to go for the opening bell. Let's listen in. The hedonism of the U.S. consumer, as you see, tens up, eight basis points and change on Bloomberg. Okay, I'm going to an ad as well. Fine then. So, okay, we talked uh, Google AI. We've talked 
Tesla, efficiency and margin. Hong Kong approved a Bitcoin and Ethereum spot ETF. It's worth noting. I think BTC is still in that 66 range, by the way, after the Israel invasion. A little bit more sensitive than stocks, it seems. You've got, uh, you know, you had this breakdown where you went all the way down to about 61.7. Uh, Bitcoin ran all the way up to about 73.8. Uh, it's sort of been trading sideways and consolidating for about the last month and a half. After the Israel anticipatory attack, we were down to about 67. When the attack happened, we were down to about 61.7. So uh, clearly we've rebounded a lot since then, mostly because markets have now come to terms with the fact that this was, this was a strike back by Iran. It totally failed. It, you know, uh, Israel could declare victory on this. Uh, you do not need a huge response back and you could really prevent sort of this escalation World War III style fear. Gold's basically flat, silver's up one six. Copper's up 214, bonds are up 11 bips. Let's take a look at how the five year break even is moving after some of this data. Five year break even. Let's see here. Yeah, some people say it wasn't meant to succeed. Yeah, I hear people saying this and I'm like, it was a freaking embarrassment. Stop, stop trying to defend that. It, that was highly embarrassing. They sell those weapons, they sell those drones. It was a joke, it was pathetic. It shows you how how like a week, uh, you know, a, a country like this, these these saber rattlers are. I mean, imagine that. To me, it's kind of like you know, imagine going to war with North Korea and they throw little pebbles at you, and you're like, <laughs> that's it. <laughs> like that's what it felt like. It's like the messaging is like at least do something. This was a joke. Anyway, that's my opinion. You don't have to agree with it. And I don't really care if you don't. Uh, Five-year inflation expectations have now risen to the highest level. Mm. Well, that we've really seen in like the last, since COVID. Uh, but we're at uh, 2.55. 2.55% was the uh, five is the five-year break even now. Uh, it's 2.552. It's sort of the highest we got last week was about 2.55. Four, two, that was about the highest. Uh, and so that was rounded to about 2.55. Now we've actually broken through that 2.55. Okay, fine. Well, let's see, what else? Strong general merchandise spending supports bullish stock view. Yeah, uh, especially at stores like Amazon. Yeah, duh. Uh, retail sales ask the question, why own treasuries? Right, might be a while before you start getting some capital appreciation there. May as well sit in money markets. Exactly. This is uh, raises the question of uh, sort of the no landing economy. Yeah, that's interesting. I don't write that one down. Uh, this is uh, bringing up more more commentary now appearing about a no landing economy. So no landing is worth noting. We'll put some notes down. No landing is. Not great for bonds as it doesn't give you as much cap appreciation. Uh, better off in money markets, right? Better off in money markets. Uh, rates higher for longer, basically. Uh, what else? Um, <laughs> no landing economy. I mean, really, it delays recession bats, right? Delays recession bets. That's probably about right. Oh, 13 minutes to go here. Okay, very good. So, what else? Goldman trading can help sell uh, set off, offset some of Friday's sell off. Got it. Positions rebuilding cautiously. Okay. Stock buyback blackout for Q2 earnings. Yeah, well. Stock market don't care. Tesla only down about a third right now. Getting above that Fibby. Well, actually, it's not a Fibby. It's a day trade line. 170.02. Last week, by the way, uh, Friday, uh, right before I had a meeting in uh, Fort Lauderdale, and then I took the kids to Universal, and now I'm back. But uh, on my way over, it was really fun because uh, I was trading. I was looking at some property uh, as uh, in the Midwest for house hack. 
and I'm day trading Tesla uh, into the close probably for like the last three or four hours. And the day before I had a bad like negative $10,000 day. That day, uh, if I remember correctly, it was like a plus like 16 or $20,000 day or whatever. And it was great. And that was all on Tesla calls, even though Tesla was down 2%, picked it up when it was down 2%. And then I just sort of like, I go back to one eight one seven sell, <laughs> then reopen it too. It was great. Like this is the barcoding Tesla was doing last week was fantastic, and a lot of it was driven by the lines that we like to use and, and draw here. So as usual, if you want all of those trading alerts that I send, you can take inspiration from them. They're not designed for you to copy me. Just take inspiration from them. Uh, check out the stocks and site group. Uh, we have a price increase coming this Friday with new lectures coming out, which is exciting. A lot of uh, highly anticipated lectures coming out uh, between Friday and this weekend, and uh, that'll be really fun. So probably the lectures will be live Sunday, but the price increase will be on Friday. So stay tuned for that. Okay, uh, so we're now 11-ish minutes away from the bell, and it does still look like we've got about 11 basis points. Eh, yeah, about 11 basis points on that 10-year treasury, sitting about 4.61. Nice. Awesome. Yeah, it was funny too. There were some people this weekend that are like, "How, how come, uh, how come you're you're making a video while you're in line with your kids? You should be spending time with your kids." It's like, dude, being in line is like the most boring thing ever. Uh, everybody can have a little chill pill for the ten minutes it takes to film a video while you're in line. Uh, but no, they they were wonderful. They were really good. Uh, on the actual uh, day of Universal. Islands of Adventure is amazing. We got Jack on the Velocicoaster and Hulk. Max is still too short for some of these, but some of those 3D rides are getting really, really good. So, uh, really fun. Really fun. So, okay. Uh, what else do we have here? So, somebody here says, Kevin, why are you day trading? Aren't you busy running house hack? Very busy, doing a lot of different things. But you have to remember that my job is to lead the teams and the companies that we have. If I'm supposed to do everything myself, you can't scale. So, you know, we have 12 or 13 employees at House Hack, uh, in, in, uh, in-house legal counsel, uh, you know, in-house analysts, uh, in-house property management. Like, if, if I'm sitting around, uh, like, dicking around on House Hack stuff all day long every day, what, what what that means is we're actually not capable of scaling. We're not efficient. Scale comes over time with House Hack, and that's my job is to drive our ability to grow House Hack. What grows House Hack the most? Well, making sure we can have a successful launch of mini funds. What helps a successful launch of mini funds? Well, making sure more people are aware of what we're doing with mini funds and that you can 1031 into House Hack mini funds or being aware that we have a fundraise coming up in our PPM, well, a fundraise ending coming up on at the end of June. How do you do that? Well, by talking and providing more value on YouTube. So you have to realize you got to put me where I'm most productive for house hack, which is telling more people about the great things we're doing for house hack. And then I teach and train people who can execute those things. So uh, if you think I should be sitting around doing property management all day long and not uh, uh, making sure the company can actually grow, then clearly you're misunderstanding the point of how to grow a business, but that's okay. I don't expect you to know that. That's why I'm explaining it. So, uh, okay. Uh, <laughs> geez, 99% of people are clueless as to how business and money works. That's all right. I'll try to do my best to explain it. Uh, so, uh, okay, good. So let's see here. We have, we have, we have, we have, uh, Andres West says, can you switch to a different streaming platform? X is pixelated, even on my one gigabit Wi-Fi. Go to YouTube. Uh, I stream this on YouTube. Right now we've got, what do we have? We have on YouTube 5,500 people watching on YouTube, 4,000 people watching on X, and 69 people watching on Twitch. I could do that with StreamYard, by the way. It's kind of cool. I just push a button, and then I could stream on StreamYard to all the different platforms, which is, oh my gosh. Uh, 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 senior VP Drew Baglia, uh, uh, Baglino uh, is now said to leave Tesla. Another executive departure coming to Tesla. Uh, this is interesting. He was just selling. Wasn't he just? I thought I just saw. I'm not sure about this. But I thought he was just selling uh, some uh, shares 
Again, I'm not sure about that, but I thought he was just selling shares. So he is in manufacturing. He's been working uh, as an executive officer at Tesla, senior vice president of powertrain and energy engineering since 2019. He's a uh, Stanford student. Uh, he moved to Tesla. Oh, moved to Tesla in 2006 as an electrical engineer. Dude, he's been at Tesla since 06. Are you serious? Wow. Uh, so at Tesla since 2006, now leaving. Yikes. Yikes. Uh, that's, uh, that's, that's really incredible. Uh, that's uh, really interesting. The stock right now isn't moving very much on the news. I don't know how broadly the move has moved yet or, or, or how, how broadly that information has spread yet. But um, that is interesting. You're getting, I mean, this, this follows uh, obviously our CFO departure, right? So, uh, you know, not ideal. Uh, not ideal. So I'm going to write this down. Sort of a not ideal list uh, for Tesla would be uh, CFO leaving uh, in 2023. Now we've got Drew. Uh, let's write this down. Drew Baglino uh, with Tesla since 2006 announcing he's leaving uh, April 15, 2024. Uh, or made his announcement today, uh, announcing April 15th that he's leaving. Again, he is the uh, executive officer and senior vice, pre uh, senior vice president, uh, VP of powertrain and energy engineering. Interesting. Uh, yeah, he's been there for a while. That's, that's, wow, that came out of nowhere. Okay, uh, <laughs> probably brought, bought by Ford <laughs> since they have no idea how to engineer. <laughs> That's a good one. That's a good one. Uh, yeah, long time at Tesla, honestly. You have to respect he's been there for, for quite a while. It's just a tough time to see them leave, you know? That's a tough time to see. Like, Tesla's really going through a hard time right now, and it's, it's tough to see people leave uh, during these sort of times. Uh, so, oh, somebody here writes, when is Elon going to leave? Oh, no, no, um, no, see, I disagree with that, uh, Riviera. See, somebody says, oh, well, somebody could make the same argument about Elon not having all of its time, his time at Tesla. Now, see, I completely disagree with that because see, what you're getting with Elon is you're actually getting... Uh, uh, recently, he's been better about FSD, right, and focusing on the company more. But what you're getting is a, a political commentary that, in my opinion, actually hurts the mission of the company, right? That would kind of like me be going on the Internet uh, and Twitter all day long talking about how, you know, landlords suck and real estate is the worst investment ever. Like, that's stupid. I'm actually working every single day to promote the vision of House Hack because I seriously believe in that vision wholeheartedly. So I promote that vision every single day. Obviously, that I, my, the vehicle that I could do that is, is YouTube. I, I don't own a social media platform like Elon does, right? But the point is he does and basically hurts the company <laughs> for his commentary. It's like totally the opposite. It, it like literally you could not make it more opposite to, to my work. <laughs> like my work, getting the most important thing for House Hack hands down, the most important thing for that company is making sure that our uh, mini funds do exceptionally well. And and the way to do that is awareness because it's a fantastic product. Uh, I'll be investing in it myself as well. So anyway, all right, let's focus on the sticks as we go into the uh, uh, pre-market here. So, or rather the, uh, the market open. Oh, that's me. Uh, we're already there. So uh, what do we have here? So uh, 66.3 on... BTC. You know, I think this is so funny. Uh, first of all, you could leave. You don't have to announce your departure. I don't really care. This person, Karan. Kevin is so biased nowadays, planning to unsubscribe. You know what this is? Is you have a lot of people who are like, Kevin's, 
Kevin's just fudding about Tessa. He, he's, he obviously is short Tessa. Uh, he's just fudding Tessa. No, I'm not short Tesla. Uh, and what's actually most important is when, when you listen to what people say, uh, you should think to, your, uh, to yourself, what came first, the fear about fundamentals or the positioning? Well, usually it's the fear about fundamentals, right? When the fundamentals change and the facts change and the data change, you should react. If instead it turns into, well, no, you're just fearful because you're talking your book. No, the fear comes first most of the time, right? <laughs> so, like, I think people have this this problem, though. It was sort of like during the AMC days. I hate to say it, but who remembers the AMC days when I talked about the APE shares? And I basically went, I went on this channel and I'm like, guys, the APE shares are a scam. That was me, like, regularly making video. I'm like, it's a scam. You're going to get raped and reamed and destroyed. I'm, I, and, and I gave all the factual evidence for it and broke it all down. And the amount of hate I got, what, you're talking crap about AMC. You must be short AMC. You hate AMC. You're just a hater. And it's like, well, there's a reason I'm still making content and a lot of AMC YouTube content creators are struggling to. It, it's because that was the truth. <laughs> and sometimes people are like, but you're, but you're talking bad about my stock then don't come if you don't want to hear it. <laughs> you know, you could, you could do this. Nah, 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 nah. <laughs> but that's your mental problem. That's your psychological problem, not mine. <laughs> so, uh, oh well. Anyway, let's get to the opening here. We've got the bell coming up in 20 seconds. Factory. I wonder if those layoffs will even include some of the workers there. It must be very difficult to compete for EVs. Look, we saw a lot of Teslas on the street in, in Beijing as well, but those showrooms, the Baidu, for instance, Geely, new robo car. Yep. I mean, you, meant, you asked me about quality. They look nice. Oh, man. It's a like a that is a competitive market, and it's a competitive oh. market increasingly in Europe where all those Chinese EVs are going. Let's get the opening bell here in the CBC Real Time Exchange. Oh, Rohan Patel also leaving. Are you serious? This is the uh, Senior Global Director of Public Policy and Business Development at Tesla. Also leaving Tesla. That's yet, an, uh, that's another one. Uh, so, uh, Rohan Patel. Now, let's write this down. Rohan Patel uh, announcing April 15th, 2024. Uh that he's also leaving. He uh, was the senior global director of public policy and business. He's actually pretty, pretty liked person over at Tesla. So uh, not not ideal. That's that's now two leaves. Somebody says, is somebody else leaving as well? Oh my gosh. Uh, uh, well, let's, let's look at the sticks for a moment because I want to see where the trades are going to be today. Uh, okay, so let's get the stickies going here. Uh, okay, okay. The Qs. We got red candlesticks on the Qs at open. Goldman Sachs, moon at open. Uh, you've got AMD down again. Oh, come on. You could not have a more perfect line to come down off of. It could not be more perfect. End phase down. Those strong retail sales reports should be pushing down interest rate sensitive. But but markets are not always logical. So I, I recognize that. Markets are not always logical, but technically we should be seeing interest rate sensitives move down on uh, on, on a hot retail sales report. It is very good for no recession though, right? Uh, NVIDIA, big red candlestick down, still up. 70 basis points. Tesla down uh, off that 170 line, down about 1.15. MSFT, Microsoft, trying to go down but still up 80 bips. Uh, MicroStrategy stable. Amazon only up 34 basis points. Apple rip down 1.22%. Uh, I've started really increasing my position on Apple at 169. I think we're going to keep getting these uh, the, these sort of like year over year comp numbers on iPhone uh, deliveries deliveries uh, going down. Uh, and uh, it's going to be about a year to create that bottoming process. But personally, I think it's a great buying opportunity and I don't mind if this goes back into the 160s so I could allocate some more because I think they will do very well on on-device AI.
that has me very enthusiastic as on device AI. But but again, please like go go down more because I'll buy more. Like I'm not I'm not trying to talk this stock up. I really don't care if this goes down right now uh, because it's like I want more uh, Apple shares because I do think the on device AI not sending your stuff to OpenAI or the cloud or whatever that's going to be a a, a really critical future. Uh, and uh, manufacturing those devices, I think, will be very profitable, along with the subscription plans, so I'll probably come with it. Google, obviously, announcing that Google Photos AI today, uh, or, or it may have been yesterday that they announced it. But anyway, uh, very exciting, actual practical stuff here. Practical, good, good, good. Uh, Uber is up 1.5. Intel, oh my gosh, Intel's up? Uh, Intel up 164. Starbucks, you know, I walk in in Fort Lauderdale, I walk into... Uh, uh, a Starbucks, and uh, well, they kicked Lauren out because she didn't have shoes on. But we just came off the beach, and we're like, "You guys suck." But anyway, um, yeah, McKay's like, "You know, they're under eighty-five dollars a share now." <laughs> you know, like, "Well, oh, my price target is eighty. Come on, baby, we're almost there." <laughs> uh, back up to eighty-five though, right now. Ooh, Salesforce down three percent. That indicates news. Let me see what's going on here. So, Salesforce, uh, in advance talks to buy Informatica, yeah, unlikely, little overlap, blah, 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 blah. I don't think, I don't know what that is. Uh, let me find out. But I don't think Salesforce really has great, like, AI actually in existence. Their whole, the whole Einstein thing, I think, is... I think it's a scam mostly because when I've called their sales teams, they're like, yeah, we just have that there to sort of sales pitch, but it's not really functional right now. You know, that was earlier uh, last year. No, it may have been mid last year. I'm not sure. So maybe it's updated, but I just, I feel like that, that just pisses me off. <laughs> so Informatica, get ready to bring data and AI to your life. Yeah, yeah. So it's a data and AI play. Okay. Yeah, that doesn't, that does not surprise me that they want to buy a company like this. Uh, by industry, higher education, financial services, energy, government, healthcare, life sciences, blah, 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 blah. Okay. Yep. They're looking for an AI play. That makes sense. And now they're going to pay for it. Okay. All right. I mean, I, I respect it. That's why these big companies have a lot of, you know, they've got a lot of money. And the reason they keep cash on hand is to do exactly this. So good for them. ASML, green, 1.6. Dell's up, 1.4. Dave & Buster's comes back. This sucker almost sold off like 10, 10 bucks. Uh, yeah, I'm getting these messages here over and over again that uh, Ashok is also leaving uh, Tesla. This is uh, yet another, let me see if he's tweeted anything or, or where you guys are getting this. These are a lot of departures. Uh, and uh, this is, um, you know, this is somebody that's big on the computer vision side. So he's a robotics engineer with uh, broad experience in uh, computer vision. I'm trying to find out quickly how long he's been at Tesla. Oh, he's joining Redwood Materials as CTO. 17 years at Tesla. Whoa. Whoa. Interesting. Okay. Once in a lifetime opportunity to go to Redwood Materials. Wow. What a set of departures today. You're right. So uh, that's that's remarkable. Let's write that down as well. So that's those are three big senior departures here. Uh, 2024 uh, that he's also leaving. Uh, 17 years with Tesla. Uh, robotics engineer with broad experience com from computer vision. Now becoming CTO at Redwood Materials. Wow, that's a that's a lot of. Gee, <laughs> a lot of departures here. My goodness. So, and he didn't announce that departure on Twitter, just on LinkedIn. So, that's a third departure on the day here. How's uh how's the stock holding up after that? Three departures. Oh, down about 2% right now. So this is uh let me see what what his letter says. I mean, usually their departure letters are just, you know, it was great. We did good work. Grateful for the opportunity. You know, had the opportunity to go to something better, blah, blah, blah. Like, they always try to make it seem like it's okay, like it's normal. But it's, this is rough, man. Three departures like this. I mean, he was the director of autopilot for five years. Oh, I didn't know that. 
uh, director of autopilot for five years. Uh, and, uh, and he worked on the autopilot team before that as well. So show all activity. Okay. Where's this post? There is it. I see it there. I see it behind the little paywall, but I don't I'm trying to find the darn thing. Ah, whatever. I'll, I'll look for it a different time. But uh, anyway, okay, yeah, so that's those are three big departures uh, today. You've got Drew Baglino uh, leaving, senior VP of uh, powertrain and uh, energy engineering with Tesla since 2006. Stanford guy. Uh, he Then you had Rohan Patel announcing today he's also leaving. Senior global director of public policy and business. Ashok. Uh, also announcing today that he's leaving after 17 years with Tesla, robotics, and uh, computer vision AI. Wow. Uh, that's crazy. Okay. So, what else? Is it time to buy the dip on Tesla? <laughs> All right. What else we have here? So, BTC dropped about 200 bucks here in the last 10 minutes. You've got NVIDIA is trying to climb again. Uh, really tough, really tough to, to, to uh, uh, push down uh, NVIDIA under that, uh, under that next FIB. Solid bounce at that 850, and it is, it is just getting bought, bought, bought. Uh, so, pretty, pretty remarkable. Yeah, I can't link where it says uh, that, uh, uh, let's see here, Ashok? Ashok, I only see that on LinkedIn, but I see it behind a paywall. Let me see. Maybe I could see this. Uh, I'm trying to find that. No. So, oh, okay. Hold on. The, so, I only have... Right now, what I really have is I have Drew Baglino and... Uh, Drew Baglino from Bloomberg, and I have Rohan Patel from Bloomberg. I don't have Ashok yet. So I don't know if uh, that is just, if that's not, I'm going to, I'm going to hold off on saying anything on eHack about Ashok. I don't have ca a confirmation on Ashok yet. So I'm going to pull that back because I, I don't see that on his Twitter and uh, his LinkedIn doesn't actually show he has any posts. So I don't know if the Ashok one is, is a false rumor but the only ones so far that are confirmed by Bloomberg are Baglino and uh, Rohan. And let me see if they have sources for it. Uh, actually, I'm going to look at Reuters too so I could fact check. Uh, so, no, I'm not going to take away on eHack what's actually provided in, uh, by Bloomberg and Reuters. So... Let's see here. Let's go to, let me see if I can get news from them. So we got Drew Baglino has left. Uh, that is per a Bloomberg journalist post on X. Okay, let's find that out. Let's see if we can source that. So I do, the only one I don't have a source on is uh, Ashok. So Ashok could be false. Yeah, and let's see here. Bloomberg, Baglino. I don't know. Let's see here. Yeah, there. So this is where you could see Senior Vice President Drew Baglino has left the automaker. But see, but it's also according to people familiar with the matter. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> so it's, it's, on, it's on Reuters. It's on Bloomberg. Uh, it's on uh, news decks. So this is really interesting. I mean, you're seeing this across the board here. Ed, Ed Ludlow. So Ed knows this pretty well. Let me see here. Ed Ludlow. He's pretty connected. Let me see what he says. There it is. Drew has left Tesla, I'm told. Okay, interesting. Uh, so... One source said he resigned as opposed to being part of the layoffs. Okay, so I'll write this down. I'm going to write on eHack that this is reported by 
Bloomberg, probably, uh, Bloomberg, and then the Rohan one, trying to fact check that. Rohan Patel, I mean, I'm seeing that here on Bloomberg as well, but I'm trying to get some more on that. Stand by for news. <laughs> Four minute little lead time on that. Okay, interesting. Let's go with Rohan Patel. That's the biz dev guy. He didn't post anything. Yeah, the three most active Tesla execs on Twitter have lost their verified badges. Rohan, Ashok, and Drew Baglino. That's interesting. So there, some people might be basing this off of losing the Twitter badges, which could happen for any reason. Uh, let's write that down. So Ashok. Uh, also, all, all three lost their Twitter badges. Okay, we're going to go back to the sticks as well here in a moment. Uh, no Twitter badge. So I'm going to put question mark. And then no Twitter badge. Uh, 17. Okay. Okay, five years director of autonomy. That's, that's Ashok. But again, we don't... We're, we've got to verify it. So I'm going to just say... To be verified. To be verified, though reported by Bloomberg. It's not Reuters today. Okay, so we're watching that. All right, let's go back to the sticks. Let's see what else is happening here. So we've got the cues. Uh, yeah, p please just be a glitch. <laughs> Watch, e Elon goes in and says, fake news. So I'll write that down. Let's say, uh, uh, watch... Elon, uh, Elon tweet, uh, that lies. <laughs> oh man, what? It's just crazy here. But uh, if it is true, that would be quite a shock. So we'll, we'll keep in mind. We'll watch that. All right. So let's keep going here. So we've got. Oh, Tesla's down about three percent right now. Uh, the Qs are up about seventy bips. That's pretty good. Uh, Bitcoin got about its three hundred dollars back. Goldman Sachs down about four six five. Uh, Trump's down about 11, AMD's down about 1, NVIDIA down 0.16. Yeah, so far I'm only getting confirmation from Reuters on Drew, but they're also using Bloomberg's Ed Ludlow on this, and he seems to be citing just sort of people familiar with the matter, which we've, we've seen that sort of news uh, get adjusted before by Elon, so we'll see what happens. And watching to see if there's any other news. Not really. Okay. Yeah, no other really major news coming through the tapes right now on anything. Let me see. What are our next catalysts for these stocks moving? And what's moving the largest today? Astera Labs. Yep. One of your more volatile AI plays. ASML, though. Nice move as well. Uh, Intel, 2%. NVIDIA is 1.7. Not bad. Uh, and then if I go to the bottom here, it's really Trump Media Group, uh, Sunrun, Reddit. So you got your interest rate sensitives over here. So then you've got, uh, let's see here. Next catalyst tomorrow, housing starts building permits, industrial production. Those are all tomorrow. You get mortgage applications Wednesday. Uh, initial jobless claims Thursday. Not actually a lot of catalysts this week. So a little quiet on caddies. Palantir. Let's see what's going on with Palantir. Palantir is sitting about, what are we up? 1.32. Yeah, still trying to get insight on what's going on with Rohan or Ashok. Yeah, and, and what they're referring to, by the way, is this Tesla badge. I'll show you this. This uh, this Tesla badge right here, which on, on X, if you go in here and you click that, it indicates that you work for the company. So uh, let's go type in uh, Ashok. 
you can see his badge is not there. He does still indicate he's at autopilot slash AI at Tesla. And then if I go for, um, what is it? Uh, so you got Ashok, you've got Rohan, and then uh, Drew uh, Baglino. Yeah, there he is. He, he doesn't even have the verified badge anymore right now at all. So really interesting. So again, who knows? Maybe maybe it's just a glitch. But uh, we'll watch for that. So, and those guys were pretty active on uh, on X as well. In a positive way too. I always thought. I always thought they were very positive about the brand. Good good brand ambassadors. Amazon, look at that. Back to its one percent up. Uh, this is uh, Amazon and Apple have been a little enthusiastic for me in terms of uh, what I've been looking at. Uh, really increasing exposure to. And so these retail sales numbers today should help actually both of them. Although t Apple still has to go through a little bit of a bottoming process on those Apple numbers. So let's see, then you've got, what else do you have? What else, what else, what else? Salesforce trending down 4%. Let's see what the suits are saying today. I've kind of got, it doesn't seem like sticks are really moving that heavily right now. Let's go back to the queues. Okay, so let's go here. What do we got? Wall Street bull case for stocks doesn't rely on Fed rate cuts. How funny. We just talked about that this moment, uh, this morning. So just this morning, we, we, uh, we even posted that on eHack. We talked about how uh, interest rates may be less sensitive or uh, less important for the stock market. So that was the first thing we put on ehack.com uh, this morning. So now I'm going to make a little note, um, edit 0649, um, Bloomberg now reporting that uh, higher rates may be less important for the stock market. <laughs> Hey Bloomberg, are you watching? Hey, hey, that that'd be an honor. I'll 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 give it that. I'm not saying that's what is what is happening, but we literally made that argument this morning uh, and explained it by sort of comparing uh, the moves in the stock market where we've been sort of topping out. But even as we've gone from expecting seven rate cuts to like one and a half rate cuts this year, uh, we let's let's see what we are now. We are seeing the stock market stabilize, right? So consider right now we are pricing in 1.52 cuts. Uh, as of 0650, markets are pricing in 0. Uh, sorry, 1.52 cuts uh, by December 18th. Uh, that's down from about six to seven cuts uh, at the start of the year. Since then, uh, the market has mostly been flat, which is actually pretty impressive if you think about it, right? So, you know, you're like to go from seven, six to seven cuts to 1.5. <laughs> That's crazy. It was just crazy uh, to see the stock market stable on that. Okay. What else? Uh, let's see here. Uh, solar rooftop solar sales plunge 90% over what time frame? You see this here. Wall Street Journal reports home solar boom gets a gut punch. The amount of solar power U.S. homeowners install could shrink 13% this year. Is this like 90% from the top or what? Uh, oh, oh, at one company, sales plummeted 90%. Got it, got it, got it, got it. Okay. Yeah, solar's been nuts. Solar's been 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 really uh, a tough. They've got hit hard. NEM3 hit way harder, and then obviously rates being way higher for way longer hit pretty hard. Not a surprise, though. Uh, it seems like that you're, you've been really stuck in that 113 to 119 range for end phase for a bit here. All right, Q is stable to up, Palantir up, 
Tesla rotating down more. I, did we did we get any more confirmation on this? Because it'd be nice to be able to say we have confirmation from the company, but all we have right now is Doomberg and verification badges. Uh, there's now a full Bloomberg article on it. Two, it's a, it only says two. Senior Vice President Drew Bagliano resigned from the company, according to one of the people who has not to be identified because the information is private. He's been one of just four named executives at Tesla. Oh, that's interesting. Uh, that's, that, that is a sort of a good point as well. So I'm going to say that uh, just one of four named executives at Tesla. Okay. He leading engineering and tech. We saw that batteries, energy, 18 year veteran co-hosted earnings calls. Yep. That's true. I remember that. I write that down too. Uh, Tesla Musk didn't respond to a request for comment. Okay. So where's, where's the second one? So that's Drew. Uh, let's see here. Bagliano made arrangements to sell up to 115,000 shares through the end of the year. Where's... So... See, they don't actually give a second name in the article. Oh, well, just, just the loss of Kirkhorn, but that was earlier. But what about Rohan? Rohan, I see. So no confirmation yet on Rohan either. Uh, so Ashok and Rohan to be determined, I guess. But still a headline here. Tesla VP of public policy, Rohan Patel is said to leave company, but no confirmation on that one yet. No, no full article on that one yet. So it appears to be uh, this Rohan... Rohan and uh, Ashuk have the weakest confirmation so far. Uh, and then Drew has a full Bloomberg piece on him for whatever that's worth. Okay. Interesting. Um, all right. So obviously not good for Tesla, but uh, we'll, see, we'll see when we actually get some fact checking on this uh probably via like an elon tweet which right now we don't have but we'll watch that we do have uh the cues still stable and let me see is elon active right now i always like to see if he's active so his last post was about an hour ago yeah a few few tweets an hour ago but that's it uh, Tesla now down three and a half. Uh, Nvidia is up about uh, two and a third. AMD goes positive. No way. Bullish. Uh, bullish there. If AMD if AMD can break through over here, that's bullish. Looks like we're starting to get rejected at the one sixty four. Uh, what else here? Super Micro. Two nine two. Microsoft one. Spies up seventy eight bips. Very nice. Sun runs down four, ouch, uh, and falling more. They're even more volatile than Enphase. Google's only up about half percent. And then if I hit Apple, what's our VIX as well? No, VIX is down about 5%, so less volatility. Apple down about percent. Arms down half a percent. There, look at, look at uh, Amazon. Perfect rejection there at 188.4. <laughs> we're gonna have a v-shaped recovery <laughs> yes that's what i would do if i were elon right now i'd be like folks we're going through a hard time but we're gonna have a v-shaped recovery <laughs> no, it's funny it just reminds me of the covid days oh boy yeah we did talk about tesla's um job cuts we've got let me see how rivian's doing right now rivian uh, and then uh, when I get to trading today, I'll send alerts again to everybody in the Stocks and Psych group, uh, whether that's during or after our course member live or maybe even before. Uh, remember, the price is going up this Friday for Stocks and Psych, and we're coming out with new content this Sunday for a lot of the different uh, courses. Uh, a lot of your suggestions. We'll have new lectures, which will be really fun. 
did have a delicious, I can't remember what it was, but it was between sixteen and $20,000 profit day on Friday. And uh, uh, yeah, it's been, it's been pretty good the last few weeks. So Apple, yeah, uh, Rivian's dropping like a rock. Why is Rivian dropping so much? Let me see what Rivian's news is. Are they just sort of, <laughs> uh, are they just sort of, yeah, there's no news on Rivian. That's bizarre. So no news on Rivian. Uh, see, what's also interesting is Grok, which is uh, Elon's AI, has this summary. Uh, Andrew uh, Bagliano, this is Drew, right, has left. So... Bagliano played a crucial role in the company's powertrain and energy engineering sector. So this is sort of summarizing the tweet storm here. But again, still no confirmation on Rohan or uh, the other guy. Ashok. But we do know that Rivian is falling rapidly. So Rivian, I think you're... How low are you now? Your all-time lows. Yep. 866 is an all-time low for the stock. And it's getting whacked. All right. End phase half percent down. Ah, wow. What a weird drop on BTC. Hmm. That's about a $400 drop from where we were when we last looked at it just about 20 minutes ago. Uh, AMD just turned negative. Donald Trump's stock moving down. NVIDIA's topping out. ARM's trying to go positive. Amazon's topping out as well. Getting rejected. These classic rejection lines here. JPM up. Buy the dip on JPM, I guess, after a uh, 5% drop. Baba's flat. They had a drop on Friday as well. Friday was a rough day for a lot of stocks. Elf Beauty, Disney's up 6.4. Uh, now they've come down from about 120, right? Yeah, they have. Look at that, almost almost perfect. A couple bucks off, but uh, getting rejected there <clears throat> on a fib line. Wayfair is down another 42 basis points. They had a rough Friday. I wonder how Restoration Hardware is doing. Because retail sales are up. <clears throat> I thought furniture might be up today. Nope. Uh, restoration hardware is also negative today. And then we did see that Intel was, yeah, Intel is up. Intel's keeping on to some up. All right. Well, let's see here. Oh, still nothing from Ila. It's probably sleeping. I know you guys are better late. Well, based on his tweets. It's the assumption. Mostly schedules them, but, well, oh, it seems pretty interactive. All right. Uh, no, no, no additional confirmation though. Oh <clears throat> no! Uh, now we're getting it. Rohan Patel has also left the company. Justin. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> hold on. Who posted that? Was that Ed? Ed as well. I just saw. I just see a red. Yep, there it is. So, Ed Ludlow as well. So I'm. I'm. I'm just gonna. Well, I'm gonna bookmark these. I don't like liking things anymore because people think that, like, I actually like it. It's like, I don't like that they leave. I don't, like, I want, like, I want to rebuy Tesla. You know, it's, it's, we're past tax loss harvesting. I want back in. Uh, but, um, you know, some of the developments over the last month have made me nervous. I'm like, look, I could buy back cheaper right now. I'm going to declare victory. Buy back cheaper. Yay. Okay. Sold for 30 days and bought back cheaper. Like that, but that's not what this is about. This isn't about, you know, trying to be right on social media or whatever. It's it's about, is that the fundamentally right decision to make right now? So, uh, you know, this is this is uh, not not ideal. Uh, Rohan Patel, and this is with Dana Hall, newspaper gal covering Tesla space. At what? Okay, what what is she saying? Who's this? Uh, I don't see where she's getting this news from. 
Any replies? Yeah, I don't know where that's coming from, but okay. So, TBD, I suppose. Uh, Tesla stock is recovering, though. It's trying to bottom out here. Uh, it looks like it bottomed out about 3.5%. Yeah, I have a screenshot from Ashok April 1st, and he didn't have the Tesla badge then. Oh, that's good. So, maybe, maybe Ashok is still there. Who knows? But that is interesting. You can hide your likes from the public. Oh, well, I should do that. Thank you. Uh, let's see here. Seeking Alpha released a piece on execs leaving. Yeah, probably. That's probably the, just the auto feed of the Bloomberg. Drew tweeted his departure. Oh, did he? Drew. Didn't you sell 166? No, the sales were between 171 and 175. Drew bag. You know. Let me see. <coughs> oh, yep. There it is. Drew is official. Drew is official. I made the difficult decision to move on from Tesla after 18 years. I'm so thankful I've worked with and learned from... I like that. Uh, and this is a nice post by him. Uh, I love tackling nearly, LOL, every problem we solved as a team and feel gratified to have contributed. It's so, yeah, some kind of inside joke or what. I will always have a warm spot for the people at Tesla and Tesla products in my heart. Wish the team and the company the best in the future. I joined as a junior firmware electrical engineer in 2006. A reminder to all of us to set higher expectations, I guess. Well exceeded my goals. That's really cool. See, that's a, they always have nice departure letters, honestly. They're, they're usually pretty good about that. So I'll throw that up on EHI. wonder if anybody's talking about that yet. Let's see what Sarah's talking about. A boost. All of which means when I, I'll, I ask you this every day, I mean, how is this changing people's anticipation in terms of what it's going to mean for for rates and for the probability of a cut at some point during the course of 2024, as now we say since June certainly seems to be off the table. It, it just continues to, to fuel the notion that it's going to be hard for them to cut sooner rather than later. We came into this year expecting six cuts, or the market did. Yeah. A lot of people thought that was crazy, but that was the market's expectation because the Fed itself was sounding very dovish and offered yeah. many chances, Fed Chair Powell and many meetings to try to sound a little more tough on inflation, he did not do that. I wonder if that changes, given March's reading of inflation was firm. The data continues to point to an accelerating economy. Retail sales is just another point. And by the way, the control group of retail sales was up more than a percent. That's the one that factors into GDP. So that's, that was the best since January of last year. Yeah. yeah. So that bodes well for, for the GDP and the overall economy on top of the strong jobs reports and an inflation that is still above target. I should point out the 10 year is above 4.6 for the first time since November of last year as well. Yep. Offering an opportunity when it comes to getting a return, you might add, for investors. Yeah, and then Mike Wilson and Morgan Stanley uh, with a note out over the weekend arguing that the pain for equities lies somewhere in the 4.35 to 4.4 range. Wow, we're at about 4.64 on the 10 year right now. Uh, we're up almost 14 basis points on the 10-year. Wow. Big, big, big move there. And uh, BTC stuck at about 66 right now. And it uh, does look like Apple's trying to recover a little bit. Uh, and NVIDIA still running 2.5%. It's remarkable. Okay. Amazon, 1.13. Yeah, pretty good. Good, uh, it sounds like a good AI day. Not so good over here on the energy side. Look at the energy and the uh, riskier asset side. First Solar's down two, Carvana's down two and a half, Reddit down two and a half, Lucid down two and a half, Open Door's down three, Tesla's down three, uh, Barrick Gold's down three, you've got Rivian down four, uh, Volatility's down five, Sunrun's down seven, Trump Media Group is down 15. Why? I don't understand why Rivian's moving down this much. Uh, it's a little odd. But, okay. What interesting. Somebody's got puts. TLT. Ooh. Uh, ooh. Printing on a 1.5% move. Good for you. All right. Uh, Want to see if there's anything else on Tesla quickly. Just looks like, so far, just these two. Uh, Ashok has not been confirmed yet, and no tweets from Elon. And we're going to go over to the course member live now, so 
I'm going to go ahead and um, I'll look around for a little bit more. In the meantime, I'm going to push this. Go yourself. Oh. Is that clear? All right. Even though I'm a licensed financial advisor, real estate broker, and becoming a stock broker, this video is neither personalized financial advice nor real estate advice mm. for you. It is not tax, legal, or otherwise personalized advice tailored to you. This video provides generalized perspective, information, and commentary. Any third-party content I show should not be deemed endorsed by me. This video is not and shall never be deemed reasonably sufficient information for the purpose of evaluating a security or investment decision. Any links or promoted products are either paid affiliations or products or services which we may benefit from. I personally operate and actively manage ETF and hold long positions in various securities, potentially including those mentioned in this video. However, I have no relationship to any issuers other than House Act, nor am I presently acting wow. as a market maker. Wow. Look at this. Uh, so, I'm not sure who this is or where this is. This says, seeing these types of notes in South Florida. I don't, I don't know they had. Oh, what the hell is happening to the queues? See, look at that. The Q's just lost like 10 points right there. That came out of nowhere. Watch that for a sec. But look at this. Hi, friends. I need some help. Tesla did a massive layoff last night of over 14,000 employees. And guess who was one of them? Yep, me. I woke up to an email sent at 3.45 a.m. So now I start from scratch. If anyone knows of a sales or business development position, please message me. I wonder if this is like from the, from the sales staff, like, which is interesting because I thought they would need more sales staff doing all the FSD trials. Oh, I feel bad for people like that sucks, man. That sucks. Uh, because like, how are you going to get another car sales job right now? You know, it's still car sales if you're working at the dealership, you know, doing the test drives or whatever. It's still a sales gig. I know it might not be commission based, but still, man, that sucks. Uh, are they covering that here? Or what are they? At? No. I'll listen to this briefly here, and then we'll we'll go because maybe this is something as to why the queues are falling. That they walked away from another ceasefire deal um, to return hostages over the weekend. Does it change the dynamics there? Yeah, I don't think exactly it is a proxy war with, with Iran. I think that would be an oversimplification. Uh, yeah, Hamas uh, operates with a degree of autonomy. Hamas has a population center. There, uh, there are about 2.3 million people in Gaza. Gaza is closed off. Uh, Hamas is supported by Iran, but there are no indications that I've heard from uh, intelligence services in the region or in the United States that Hamas... Uh, was directed by Iran to carry out the October 7th attack. Uh, okay. the, the the proxies are much more. The Houthis are, are are take direct orders from Iran. Hezbollah much more closely aligned with Iran. Militias in Syria and Iraq uh, a, a absolute proxies. Uh, Hamas at this stage is an independent power. It rules the Gaza Strip, and the the Israeli military is trying to dismantle. Uh, Hamas piece by piece. Uh, just a la in the last few days, most Israeli troops have pulled out of, of Gaza and they are taking something of a break. Yeah. I just want to make a quick note. I, I, I wrote on EHAC, <clears throat> you can see it here, uh, just sort of the way I've written it. One sec. Uh, I gotta update this browser. It's fine. So I, I posted that here and I wrote, if this is true, it means sales staff are part of the cuts. That's somewhat odd since we thought more of them would be needed to do FSD or uh, to do the required FSD demos unless demand is offsetting that uh, even lower, we should say. All right. Uh, well, no, not even lower because it would be lower. Why are the queues selling off, though? That's what I don't understand is the queues are about to go negative. <clears throat> what is happening? Look at that straight down. I just want to see, I mean, this is quite strange. just want to see what's going on. Volatility genie is out of the bottle. Oh no. Oh no. Okay. What, what is driving this? Uh, AI, look at AI just drop off a cliff. Cliff dove. AMD back to negative after it gets rejected. Arms down. Nvidia selling off. Microsoft selling down. Amazon pushing down, everything all of a sudden just tanking. 
Why, though? Uh, yeah, it's just... It's almost like programmatic. Everything is selling. Tax deadline? Yeah, maybe everybody's got to sell for taxes. That's that's very interesting. Yeah, I Friday focused on increasing cash again a little bit. I think my exposure to cash is the highest it's been in a while right now. Mostly it's sort of like as a hedge. I mean, it still gives you opportunities. Right? Cash, cash creates opportunities. So, but why is Rivian? Oh, yeah, everyone heard the Tesla news. I don't think Tesla is moving the market, but it may be moving Rivian. That it may be. Yeah, Tesla down now, ah, lower than where it was before. It's at 164 now. So, let's see quickly, is there anything else on this? Then we're going to go to the course member live. Uh, remember, price goes up on Friday. If you have questions for bundling up, make sure to email us at staff at mekevin.com. Yeah, Rohan Patel has also left. Uh, there's no full confirmation on that. I'm still waiting for something on Ashok. Yeah, I don't have that. All right. We'll see. All right, folks. Uh, is there anything on Israel? I'll do a quick look on Israel. I don't see anything on Israel. But I will look. Search. Uh, no, 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 I mean a lot of articles, but nothing that implies sort of breaking news out of Israel. So somebody says recession is being priced in. <clears throat> well, that's, that's, uh, you know, it seems like what the market is hopium -y about uh, not happening is having to price in a recession. Look at that bounce again. The bottom of those candlesticks, almost perfect bounce. I'll give you that line. It's 438.9. We draw a lot of these lines, by the way, in our course member lives. So if you're not part of them, you're missing out. Join me. You get lifetime access. You pay once. It's a great deal. People love it. And if you don't see something you need in the lectures, uh, we're adding more this weekend. So make sure to send over your requests. Uh, so there we go. Thanks so much, folks. And uh, we'll see you in the next one. Goodbye. Good luck. Email us at staffatmekevin.com if you have bundle